Good evening. It's 6 p.m. We are at Jesus is Lord Ministries International, and we are going to continue along the lines of spiritual gifts to the church. The last two weeks, we focused on the ministry leadership gifts of the church, and we learned that the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher those gifts to the church were given by Jesus Christ. Tonight we're going to look at the spiritual gifts and their manifestation. I'll open in prayer and then we'll get into the message. Father, I thank you for the truth in your words that you cannot lie or go against what you say, that you are faithful even when we are not faithful because God cannot lie, and that you are a covenant God, that you gave your Son, Jesus Christ, to all those that would believe because God is love, that your gift of salvation is a gift to those who believe that you gave through your son Jesus gifts leadership gifts to the church and that through your Holy Ghost there are spiritual gifts for believers and I thank you for these truths I thank you for the privilege to stand behind this pulpit and father I pray for the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, as these words through your holy scriptures go forth. And I ask that the eyes of the church are enlightened to the understanding of the knowledge of Christ and our identity in Jesus, that these are gifts available to all believers. I thank you that these words will not return void, and I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. So tonight's message, the title is called Spiritual Gifts and Manifestations. We're going to start with a reading, and you can open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm going to go through that, those 31 verses. We're going to read them. I'm going to read them to you. And Father, I pray that we all have ears to hear as your words go forth. In Jesus' name, amen. And I'm going to give you a commentary. And then we're going to go back to some of the verses to obtain wisdom, the higher wisdom of God, enlightenment and understanding through the knowledge of these gifts. Now, if you're taking notes, just write down 1 Corinthians 12, verse 1 to 31, and then write this down. Verse 1, I'm going to give you a deeper commentary on that verse by itself, and then verses 1 through 6, verse 3, 7, 12, 13, 25, 28, and 30. Now, as a brief review for the last two weeks, we've spent learning by inspiration of God through His inspired Word in Ephesians chapter, chapter 4. We learn that there's ministry leadership gifts of the church given by Jesus Christ to the church of God, bought by His blood for His purposes. That's important to understand that. The church of God, bought by His blood for His purposes. That's what the church is for. That's what these leadership ministry gifts, and some were given apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. We looked at the definition of these titles, 
and what these positions in the church, what these gifts given by Christ to the church were for. Now we're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and look at spiritual gifts for believers, believers in Christ. So if you're in 1 Corinthians, we can break this down, these 31 verses, into several sections. The first section, verses 1 through 11, Paul is going to write by inspiration of God the spiritual gifts, and he's going to talk about unity in the body in diversity. Now that sounds like it contradicts itself. Unity in the body of Christ in diversity of the members. That's the first 11 verses. Verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. Now that word ignorant, in the context of this scripture, in the Greek language, means not to know. Through lack of information or intelligence, the ability to acquire and apply knowledge and skills, not just to acquire knowledge, but wisdom is applied knowledge. So wisdom is tied to not being ignorant. It means understanding, skill. Now concerning spiritual gifts, gifts, brethren, I do not want you to not know. Now several things here. This, this one sentence, this one part, verse 1, has three parts to it. Now concerning spiritual gifts. The topic is spiritual gifts. And then he says brethren. So this is to the church. And then he makes a statement, I do not want you to be ignorant. I don't want you to not know this information. That's a powerful enlightening opening statement here in this chapter. Now in Ephesians, his letter to the church in Ephesus in chapter 1, verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Now remember, in Ephesians chapter 4, we learned about the leadership ministry gifts. And Paul opens up in Ephesians, Paul, an apostle of who? Jesus Christ, by the will of God. He's one of the gifts to the church. And he's going to talk about spiritual gifts. Remember the giver of the leadership ministry gifts is Christ Jesus, the head, the chief cornerstone of the church. And Paul acknowledges that. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God. Now, spiritual gifts, you could say, or manifestations, are what we're going to talk about this evening. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles carried away to these dumb idols. Now in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 14, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. So Paul, an apostle, a gift given to the church, is going to make sure that we, the brethren, the saints, the body of Christ, are not ignorant. Verse 3, Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God 
calls Jesus accursed, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So he's giving some clarity here. This is a church that was rich in the abundance of spiritual gifts, and yet they were ignorant. They lacked the knowledge of what the gifts were for and how to use them. So Paul is bringing clarity to the church. Verse 4, there are diversities of gifts, so there's different gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, or you could say administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, or you could say operations within the church, but it is the same God who works all in all. Remember, unity in diversity is what he's talking about. We said that sounds like it's a contradictory statement, but you've got a diversity of gifts, but the same spirit, differences of ministries or administrations, but the same Lord, and diversities of activities or operations, but the same God who works, who works all in all who works all in all. Verse 8, For no one is given, and now here's the gifts. There's nine of them. These are the gifts of the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. Now next Wednesday, we're going to continue this topic, and you're going to be given by inspiration of God a very deep a very deep understanding of what the definition of each of these nine gifts are. But right now, these are the gifts given to us by inspiration of God. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. Notice the wisdom comes through the Spirit, not through man, not through philosophy, not through psychology, not through anyone's vain imaginations, but through the Spirit. To another, the word of knowledge through the same Spirit. Now write down Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, where God says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. The word of knowledge is a divine message given to a believer for a specific purpose. And we're going to look at that in a minute as we go through this chapter. So the very first gift of the Holy Ghost mentioned is the word of wisdom. This would be the higher wisdom of God. An understanding heart to discern good and bad. To another, the word of knowledge. That's the second gift. Diversity of gifts, but the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. This is a gift. So the gift of the word of wisdom, the gift of the word of knowledge, the gift of faith, to another, gifts of healings, plural, by the same Spirit, to another, the working of miracles, that's a gift, the working of miracles, to another, the gift of prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, and to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. And then he closes this section with verse 11. But one and the same Spirit works all these things. Now listen to the last part of this, it's very important. 
distributing to each one individually as he wills. As he wills. One thing lacking in the church of God, bought by his blood for his purposes, is the leadership in the church to walk in these gifts so that after the preaching, there's an opportunity for the congregation to respond to the message. That's when these working, the working all in all, is going to happen in the assembly of the people. So in our prayer ministry group, is called up here after the preaching and people come up for prayer. When someone comes up to me, I listen to what their request is and I don't respond right away. I'm waiting to hear from the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to show you this because at the very last verse, verse 31, it is written, but earnestly desire the best gifts. And we're going to see when you're given an explanation of this throughout this teaching that if I desire these gifts, God will give them to me. If the intent of my heart is to use them to shepherd the flock for the purposes that the gifts were given to the church, if that's my motive in my heart and I sincerely desire these gifts, God will manifest these gifts through me, through a believer, for another believer, liberally, because it's His will for all believers to be used in this way. But one and the same Spirit, diversity of gifts, but the same Spirit works all these things. So when Pastor Pete, when the gift of faith that was given to me as a little boy rises up in me, there's the, the and the manifestation of the Holy Spirit, it's called the quickening of the Spirit, moves upon me, it begins to manifest in a certain way. Tears begin to come out of my eyes as the Spirit of God is working through me, and then I know that's the time to lay my hands on the sick and they'll be healed. I know that in my heart. Faith says, that's the Spirit telling me to do it now, and I will heal them. All I have to do is have an understanding of how the Holy Spirit works, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, how the Holy Spirit works, and just do it. And He does everything else. Now we're going to get to verse 12 through 31, the rest of this chapter. Now remember... Spiritual gifts, unity in the body of Christ through a diversity. Now Paul's going to write about unity and diversity in one body. He's going to talk about different members, one body, and use an analogy of the human body as he goes through this. So beginning in verse 12. For as the body, he's talking about the body of Christ is one, one body, and has many members, us, the saints, the believers, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. <laughs> That's a mouthful, but listen closely, listen carefully. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, 
being many, are one body, so also is Christ. Verse 13, For by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. Now, circle verse 12 and 13, because when we go back, when we get done with verse 31, reading through it, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God, and you're getting a brief commentary now, but your eyes are going to be enlightened by the Spirit of God as we go through some of these key verses after that. We're going to come back to verse 1, and you're going to get a deeper explanation, enlightenment of what this means. Verse 14, For in fact the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, Because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? That's a rhetorical question. And if the ear should say, Because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would, we, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? Now verse 18, but now God, God, everybody say God, has set the members, He set the members, each one of them in the body, just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? So if we were, if, if the body was just an eye, there would be no body. And some were given apostles and some prophets. Not everybody's a prophet today, even though I see many claiming to be a prophet. This is such a lack of understanding in the body of Christ because of a lack of teaching on what those gifts, the leadership ministry gifts, really are. Many of the people that I hear that come up to me and say, I'm a prophet or I'm a prophetess. Why would you approach me and want to make sure that I knew your title, that one that you think you have. Because many of these people are, are experiencing the manifestation of these gifts. These are supernatural manifestations of God. But they think because they give a prophetic word that they're a prophet and they're not. It's the gift of prophecy. It's God giving that prophetic word for, whatever, for, for to whom He wills for His purpose. For His purpose. But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet. I have no need of you. No, much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary, and those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor. And our unpresentable parts have greater modesty, but our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body having given greater honor to that part which lacks it. Now verse 25, circle this verse. That there should be no schism in the body. Now I want to repeat that. But our presentable parts have no need. That was verse 24. But God composed the body, God composed the body, that there should be no schism in the body. Now that word schism 
in the context given, used in this scripture, in the Greek language means a split or a gap, division, rent, schism, that there should be no split in the body, that there should be no gap. Remember, this is all tied together in unity in the body of Christ. Why is the body of Christ today split? It's because it doesn't have an understanding of the revelation that Paul had that he's trying to give to the church by inspiration of God. Now, as a teacher, a sent one, November 7th, I'll be leaving for the continent of Africa. And when I get there on the 8th, I'll spend some time with my host. They will have a crusade November 1st through the 5th, and the church will swell up with new converts. Now the Bible says, go and make disciples of all nations. So my job, while the Lord is sending me to the nation of Zambia is to teach the new converts Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And then Saturday and Sunday also to teach the leaders the ministry gifts given to the church by Christ what their job is in the body of Christ, the overall big picture of that and on these gifts so that they can learn what they are and how to move and flow in them. Because there is a place in the Spirit when you're walking in the Spirit that all day the Spirit of God can move through you in these nine gifts. That there should be no schism in the body but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it, or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Many members, all part of one body. You could say diversity of members makes the unity in the body. We're all different. God made us that way. But let this mind be in us, the mind of Christ, that we are in the unity of the knowledge of God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ for His purpose. And God has appointed these in the church First apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healings? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret. And then he closes. But earnestly desire the best gifts. So there is an order of the gifts. And yet I show you a more excellent way. Spiritual gifts or manifestations... For believers. Now, who did I say they're for? These gifts are for believers. Notice they're not for just the apostle. They're not for just the prophet. They're not for just the evangelist. They're not for just the pastor and teacher. As a pastor and teacher, with an apostolic call on my life, my job in the body of Christ is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. 
till we all come into the unity of the knowledge or the maturity in Christ. Now I desire all of these nine gifts earnestly in my heart, and the desire that I have is that I can minister, edify, equip the saints for the work of the ministry, to, and lift them up, to encourage them. That's exactly what the Bible says God's will is for these gifts. So as a leadership gift given to the church, I don't take this role lightly. I earnestly desire these gifts. That's the will of God in my heart. So what happens to me? God manifests there is the supernatural manifestation of these gifts that flow through me. A believer, a believer for the benefit of another believer. That's what they're for. I desire that. I don't desire these for vain glory. I don't desire these for people to come up to me and pat me on the back because the blind lady just got her eyes open. I weep when that happens. It fills me with joy that that lady that had no eyesight, that Jesus' compassion touched her because she was praising and worshiping Him. She wasn't complaining about her blindness. And Jesus said, son, go lay hands on that lady. Put your thumbs in her eyes. I hear her heart. And I'm going to give her sight. The love of Christ that passes all knowledge is the most beautiful thing for somebody to experience. I ask the Lord for knowledge of the love of Christ, but I also ask Him, Father, Jesus, Jesus, let me see Your love. And He manifests that in my heart through compassion. I feel it, and then I see it. I see the love of Christ. God is love. It, it's, it's, it's an unbelievable, overwhelming. It's the beauty of Christ, who is the express image of God our Father. Now let's go back to verse 1. These are my study notes. I've been studying this for two weeks. I've studied it before, but when I read my Bible and I begin to study, I always ask what I prayed for all of us tonight, for the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. That was a prayer that Paul prayed over the church. It's in the written Word of God, which is given to us as an instruction book, the Holy Bible. I know in my heart that when I ask that prayer in spirit and truth, in faith, working with love, it's impossible for God to not answer that prayer. So the minute that I begin to read the Bible, I, get, I begin to get an overwhelming flow, flood of revelation. Now the revelation is not my own. It comes through the Word of God because of knowledge of God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So anybody that says they have revelation, a new revelation, and you hear that, you need the gift of discerning of spirits to know whether that is from God the whole through the Holy Spirit, or is that from a deceiving spirit? 
manifested through a false prophet, a false teacher, a false doctrine given to the church. Because they're in the church. That's a gift given by God. All right, chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now look at verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. Concerning spiritual gifts. So in this, in this book, 1 Corinthians, in chapters 12 through 14, Paul deals with the gifts or manifestations of the Holy Spirit in the body of Christ. Now listen to the reason. For the mutual good of all members alike. Now I'm going to pause here a minute because this is a misunderstanding. I hope. But if there would be eight people up here to pray for others and you had a guest speaker and the lead pastor asked that guest speaker to come up when she was finished or he was finished, and that lead pastor said, I would like my ministry people, these are people of faith, to pray over you. So ministry people, would you gather around that person and pray for them? Now there's eight of us, eight people And all of the sudden, two people start yelling. One begins to yell. In English, and one begins to yell out loud. In a different tongue. Without an interpretation. Now I'm standing here, remember the gifts are given by the will of God, as the Spirit wills, and the Spirit gave me a word of knowledge and a prophetic word for that speaker. But I can't speak it out because they're not going to hear because two other people are yelling out loud. Now. They're doing that either out of a lack of understanding, thinking the louder I yell, the more God will hear my prayer, or it's a boisterous, boastful yelling because they're drawing attention to themselves. That's not the Spirit of God operating in those two people. They know not what spirit they're of in that circumstance. And yet I heard the gift of the word of knowledge and the gift of prophecy given to a believer who asked, desired the gifts for other believers, for God's purpose. So the person that was the guest speaker knelt down, humbled themselves in front of God, and I'm waiting and waiting, but there's two people yelling out loud. So, wisdom came upon me. The gift, the divine gift, a message of wisdom. And I knew by the Spirit to kneel down, turn my body away from the yelling, the confusion, the boisterous, bold, and it's not boldness. It's distractions, and, and look at me, look at me. I knelt down, turned my head away from that, and I whispered to the speaker the word of knowledge and the, and the prophetic word. And while I had my hand on her, her body began to shake as she wept because the manifestation of that gift was flowing. And she knew she heard from heaven. That wasn't from me. So if the manifestation of the gifts, if the gifts are given by the will of the Spirit to a believer, 
to flow through them for another believer, any noise, any noise is not of God. If the worship team is up here banging away and playing loud music, they're denying the flow of the Holy Spirit and it's the Holy Spirit to minister to these people. If we don't understand as the body of Christ that we have to position ourselves so that the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth, who will only exalt Jesus Christ, if we don't understand what that role of the Holy Ghost is, God help us when we deny the Holy Spirit to exalt Christ in our assembly. That loud music is denying the Holy Spirit. The people yelling are denying the Holy Spirit. It's important. God told me, get up and teach on what these gifts are and what they're for. Because there's a lack of knowledge in my church that I bought with my blood for my purposes. Now, I'm not yelling at you, but years, and that's a but. <laughs> it's a big but. I, I, I'm, I'm raising my voice. Four years ago, I heard the Lord say, One day, son, I will use you as my gift to speak my words to my church in a manner much like John the Baptist did. Now, I don't, to me, I think to myself, why me? I, I, I wasn't born as he was or as Christ was. But these things have to be spoken. If correction is not brought, when we looked at the ministry leadership gifts given to the church, the main job, the main role for the teacher was to bring clarification through correction in love to the body of Christ. Why? Because we have a job to do. We're supposed to destroy the works of the devil. How was that guest speaker going to hear a word from God, a word of knowledge and a prophetic word, if everybody's screaming and yelling? Especially if you're doing it in your prayer language. And we're going to see that Paul's not telling us not to do that privately, but in the assembly of a service, you don't do that. And this is one example of that. So, Father, I just pray that hearts, that, that you soften hearts prior to me getting up to speak, that correction has been given in love and that there is no offense. And I ask, Lord, I, I ask with the compassion of Christ for the body. In Jesus' name, amen. Gifts and manifestations of the Spirit were an indispensable part of the early church's life together. You can see that in chapter 14, verse 26, and ministry, in their life together and ministry. We keep saying as a body of Christ that we need to get back to the book of Acts, and yet we lack an understanding of what it is we're to do and how to get there. God intends that these gifts continue in operation until Christ returns. Verse, chapter 1, verse 7. His purposes for the spiritual gifts are as follows. Now, I'm going to give you four of them. Number one, this is the purpose of these gifts. To manifest the grace, power, and love of the Spirit among His people in their public gatherings, homes, families, and individual lives. Verses 4 through 7, chapter 14, verse 25, Romans chapter 15, verses 18 through 19, 
and Ephesians chapter 4, 8, among several sets of scriptures. That's one purpose. Here's number two, to help make the preaching of the gospel effective by supernatural confirmation to the message. In other words, God said, God cannot lie, God says, I will confirm the preaching afterward with signs, wonders, and miracles. If He will do that, and we believe that to be the truth, then why don't we let Him do it? Why don't we let God do what He wants to do for His people? Mark chapter 16, verses 15 through 20 Acts chapter 14, verses 8 through 18. Chapter 16, verses 16 through 18. Verses, chapter 19, verses 11 to 20. And chapter 28, verses 1 through 10. Here's the third purpose. To meet human needs and to strengthen and build up spiritually both the church, verses 7 14 through 30, chapter 14, verse 3, 12 and 26, and individual believers, chapter 14, verse 4. In other words, to perfect believers in love out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. 1 Timothy, chapter 1, verse 5, and 1 Corinthians, chapter 13. To meet human needs. That woman that was on her knees, God was going to meet her needs for what He called her to do, and He wanted to use a believer to give her a, the gift of the word of knowledge and the gift of a prophetic word in order to accomplish that. He wants the church to accomplish His will through itself through the believers in the church, to use them for the other believers that we all work together as one body. And here's purpose number four, to wage effective spiritual warfare against Satan and the forces of evil. Isaiah chapter 61 verse 1, Acts chapter 8 verses 5 through 7, Chapter 26, verse 18, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 11 through 12. And then passages dealing with spiritual gifts, in addition to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, would be Romans chapter 12, verses 3 to 8. Again, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7, verses 12 through 14. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 through 16, and 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. All of that stems in this very first verse. Now I want to lump together verses 1 through 6, spiritual gifts. The terms, the terms that the Bible uses or by inspiration of God, given by God, for spiritual gifts, specify the nature of these gifts. Now remember, this was written in Greek. So there's five, five terms used for spiritual gifts in verses 1 through 6. Number one, spiritual gifts, the Greek word pneumatica, derived from pneuma, means spirit. Remember, the term used for the gift is going to specify their nature. Spirit refers to supernatural manifestations that come as gifts from the Holy Spirit operating through believers for the common good. Verses 1, 7, and chapter 14, verse 1. I'm going to repeat that, what I said. Spirit refers to supernatural manifestations that come as gifts from the Holy Spirit operating through believers 
for the common good. Term two, gifts or grace gifts, you could say. Charismata, which is derived from charis, which means grace. This is the term, and now here's what the nature of that means. Grace indicates that supernatural gifts involve both an inward motivation and the power to perform ministry. Actualized enablement, received from the Spirit. Now why would it be an inward motivation? Verse 31, but earnestly desire the gifts. And then I wrote down in my notes, see Proverbs 16 verses 1 through 9. You could sum this up by saying the preparations of the heart. They're received from the Holy Spirit. Such gifts strengthen spiritually the body of Christ and those in need of spiritual help. Verse 4, Romans chapter 12, verse 6, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, and 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. I'm not reading these gifts for you. We went through this chapter, so you've heard the Word of God, and now I'm giving you commentary, an explanation, an enlightenment of what this means, an explanation of what these mean with all the Scriptures to show you that each one of these statements has a biblical backup. It's biblically correct. All right, number three, administrations or ministries from the Greek word diakonai, derived from diakonai. That word means service, emphasizes there that there are different ways of service and that certain gifts involve receiving the ability and power to help others. Verses 4 through 5, 27 through 31, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 and 11 through 13. Now Paul indicates that the ministry aspects of the gifts reflect the servant ministry of the Lord Jesus. If you want to be the greatest in the kingdom, you've got to be the least. I, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ by the will of God, When, when will the so-called apostles and prophets in the body of Christ begin to introduce themselves as, Hi, I'd like to introduce myself to you. I'm a servant of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and my name is Paul or Peter or whatever your name is. Thus, the operation of the gifts are defined in terms of Christ's presence and operation among us. Verse 3 and chapter 1, verse 4. I want to repeat that. The operation of these gifts are defined in terms of Christ's presence and His moving and His operation among us in the assembly of, of, the, of His church building bought by His blood for His purposes. Now, operations or effects, this is number four. Energe mata, which comes from energis, means active or energetic, signifies that spiritual gifts are direct operations of the power of God the Father and produce certain results. Verses 6 and 10. When I get up to preach, many times the Lord tells me, I want you before you begin to kneel down before the assembly of saints, lift your arms up to me, that high and holy place, look up to me, 
And I want you to ask me to pour out my power and glory so that my people can see that what I say in my word, I will do. And number five, the manifestation of the Spirit, the Greek word phanerosis from phaneros means manifest. So these terms, these five terms, are de- the nature of them are defined by the different uses. This emphasizes that spiritual gifts are direct manifestations of the working and presence of the Holy Spirit in the congregation. So why are we denying that? I have gone to many services and not and there has not been an altar call. Now when we get into the definitions of what these gifts with an explanation mean next week, you're, you're going to see, I hope, and I'll pray, and God will not return void if He gives me the message. Now verse 3, Jesus is the Lord. Paul begins the discussion on spiritual gifts with the truth. Now listen very carefully that the gifts and manifestations of the Holy Spirit will exalt Jesus as Lord of the church. So if I begin to pray over somebody in the assembly of saints, in my prayer language, and I don't have the interpretation, how am I edifying that person? They have no idea what I'm talking about. I'm actually praying for myself. That's what my prayer language is for, for my edification when I pray in private. So that means I don't have an understanding if I'm up here, or I don't know how to really pray, or I don't know how to listen to the Holy Spirit, and I just start to do that. Or I just want people to hear me yell because I want to draw attention to myself. I mean, I'm being harsh here. Because correction has to be brought, and hopefully this is happening in love. If it's not, Father, I repent and I trust that you'll correct me, and I will repent. The ultimate criterion of the Spirit's activity is an ever-growing expression of, listen, expression of the person, presence, power, love, and righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the ultimate criteria of these gifts. The manifestation, in the manifestation of the spiritual gifts, Christ Himself ministers by the Holy Spirit through His people to His people. Verses 12 through 27 in Matthew chapter 25 verse 40. Now jump down to verse 7. You'll see the words, manifestation of the Spirit. We just kind of went through these. Next week, you'll get this part. You're going to get spiritual gifts for believers, and I'm going to go over in detail what the nine gifts are, what they are, what they're for, and how do you move. I've been used of God by the Holy Spirit. Remember, these gifts are given as He wills in all nine of these gifts. Now, that humbles me. When I leave here after one of our services, I I weep a lot of times because I, I recognize the source of what just happened. Verse 12, the body is Christ. All right? And again, we'll we'll review this again, but I'll just say, see verse 1, what you were given in verse 1. Verse 13, by one Spirit are we all baptized. Now, the baptism that Paul is speaking about by inspiration of God, by one Spirit, refers neither to water baptism nor to Christ's baptism of the believer in the Holy Spirit, such as occurred on the day of Pentecost. See Mark 
chapter 1, verse 8, and Acts chapter 2, verse 4. Rather, it refers to the Spirit's baptizing believers, the Spirit baptizing believers into Christ's body, uniting them in the body and making them spiritually one with other believers. It is a spiritual transformation or regeneration that occurs at conversion and puts the believer in Christ. Now, in a future teaching, we're going to go over this regeneration. What does that mean? What does it look like? And what actually happened at the cross at Christ's crucifixion that allows this regeneration to happen? This is what is going to take you away from the law in understanding and your faith in the law versus in God, in God's grace. And verse 25, members care one for another. Spiritual gifts should not be the basis for honoring a person or considering one believer as more important than another. Verses 22 through 24, rather each person is placed in Christ's body according to to the will of God. We saw that in verse 18. And all members are important for the spiritual well-being and proper functioning of the body. Spiritual gifts must be used not in pride or for personal exaltation, but with the sincere desire to help others and with a heart that genuinely cares for each other. And then see chapter 13. Now, remember verse 31 at the close, desire the best gifts. We talked about the inward motivation. This is an explanation a little better of what you were given earlier by me, of what that inward uh, motivation would be. Verse 28, God hath set some in the church. So Paul gives here a partial gift of list of the ministry gifts. See Romans chapter 12 verses 6 through 8 and Ephesians chapter 4, 11 through 13 for other lists of ministry gifts. You can go to John chapter 6 verse 2 and you'll begin to get a definition of what miracles are, what that gift is. Romans chapter 12 verses 7 to 8 when it refers to the word helps, this is showing mercy and the gift of government or leadership. And do all speak with tongues? And I'm going to close on this. Paul's rhetorical question here implies a negative answer. Remember, these are my notes. The context in chapter 12 shows that Paul is referring to the use of of the gift of tongues and its companion gift of interpretation in public worship services. He's not attempting to limit the use of tongues in prayer and praise privately addressed to God. You can confer in chapter 14, verse 5. Most believers baptized in the Holy Spirit find it easy to pray in tongues as they yield themselves to the Spirit. On the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, verse 4. At Caesarea, Acts chapter 10, verses 44 through 46. And at Ephesus, Acts chapter 19, verses 2 through 6. All who were filled with the Spirit spoke in tongues as a sign that they had received the fullness of the Spirit. They all did. So if I'm boasting and in a public worship service, If I get out of order and I just start yelling in my prayer language, I'm out of order. That's not the Spirit of God's will for that to happen, unless there's an interpretation. Now, I want to give you a quick example. Last Sunday, I was standing up here with our ministry team. I just finished praying for somebody, and I kept being drawn to a little girl that was sitting in a chair not far from her mother. And I didn't know why, but I went over there, knelt down in front of her, and I just said, Honey, is there something you'd like me to pray for? And she said, I I already uh, asked for prayer. 
I, I, I asked for um, somebody to, to help me pray to my family members. And as soon as I heard that, these words came out of me. And I said, but you want prayer for yourself. And tear came in her eyes. And then the Holy Spirit spoke through me, through a believer, remember we learned that, for the benefit of another believer. And it was the gift of a word of knowledge and a prophetic word that came out. And she started to cry and weep because that was a desire in her and yet I believe God manifested that help to her through that word because she became a servant of Christ and asked for prayer for her family members, not for herself. And yet the Holy Spirit gave her a message to her that the Lord heard her prayers. I hear your prayers and I will answer them. And I don't remember what else came out. I, don't, I didn't remember that until I was just reminded. So next week... We're going to take a look in detail at what these nine gifts are, what they're used for. You're going to get an explanation of them and how they're to be used or how not to use them in some cases. Father, I thank you that we have the truth that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable beneficial for the wherewithal of all, for doctrine, for reproof, for conviction, for correction and instruction in righteousness, until we all come into the maturity of the image after the likeness of Christ, until that second coming and, and, and you're finished with us, Father. God, help us all to have understanding hearts that when we do bring correction, it's given in love. But I ask for the, the revelation to come upon the church that it does need to bring correction because there needs to be order, that the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of truth to exalt Christ Jesus, and it's not for... It's not for our it's not for honoring man. The Holy Spirit will only exalt Christ. And Father, I pray that these words will not return void. I thank you that these words were given for our growth for all of us. I do not exclude myself for the benefit of me. I ask that you bring these gifts to full manifestation when I arrive in Africa to teach the congregation, the assembly of saints and those leaders there on the leadership ministry gifts given to the church by Christ and the spiritual gifts given for all believers. I thank you for hearing these prayers and for answering them. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen.